Hey there, gang. Patrick King here. Thanks so much for tuning in. Episode 2 of our new audio broadcast, Talking About Horses, our live broadcast. If you're tuning in on Facebook, you can catch us live. If you're tuning in afterwards, you can catch us on YouTube. And exciting news, you can also catch us now on iTunes. So be sure to check that out if you get an opportunity. Coming to you today with our special guest, I'm pretty excited uh, to have on the phone with me Miss Madison Shambaugh, also known as Mustang Maddie. Madison, thanks so much for joining. Thank you for having me, Patrick. Awesome, awesome. So before we get started, do you prefer Madison, Maddie? How do you prefer? Um, Maddie's good. Maddie's good? Okay, great. Yep. Great. So... All right, so uh, Maddie, for the, I don't know, probably five people <laughs> in social media land who don't yet know who you are, do you want to give us a couple <laughs> minutes, um, just kind of a couple quick seconds, tell us who you are? Sure. Um, so I am a 23-year-old uh, horsewoman. I'm from Colorado and Indiana, kind of grew up part-time in both and now mainly Colorado. And um, I kind of grew up with a mixed discipline background, um, working with some problem horses, colt starting, and in 2013, got my first Mustang and was just totally hooked on the whole wild horse deal um, and really kind of wanted to do something and, you know, be active about it. Um, and so I started doing the extreme Mustang makeovers. Um, I did three of those. And um, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, I actually started traveling, um, teaching and doing what I call Meet the Mustangs uh, demonstrations, educating people about the plight of the Mustangs, their story, um, and kind of what lessons, you know, as humans we can take away from them. And then also um, incorporating some zebras into the act. <laughs> um, so that's kind of what I've been up to for the, the past year here, is teaching and sharing these guys. Um, with the public. That's fantastic. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, so I got to ask, and um, there some, some of my students know this about me. I've done some zoo animal training in the past. So seeing you with uh, the zebras really kind of piqued my attention. How, um, how in the world did zebras get involved? <laughs> right. So that is a very good question. Um, so when I was growing up, um, my grandfather, my dad's dad, he was the director of our local zoo. And he just had a passion for exotic animals. Um, he had buffalo and zebras, I mean, in his backyard. He had a pet wolf at one time and all sorts of crazy stuff. So, I mean, I remember when I was younger, I'd go out and I'd try to get close to the zebras. And, you know, you could get like, I don't know, like maybe... 30 foot from them and then if you just you know made a weird step or you know whatever they just you know run off um there was definitely no getting close to them so I never imagined I'd be training them um it kind of became a reality for me after um the extreme Mustang makeover in 2015 I uh found out about the zebra filly that was for sale like 40 minutes from my house and so um, I went out to see her and really wanted, you know, at that point, I was still kind of um, trying to get my name out there and um, still kind of just wanting, I'm always wanting to learn and improve myself and challenge myself. And the zebra, everyone said, was like the hardest of the equines to train. So I just got done training this Mustang and I was like, oh, this could be my new project. So I brought Zena <laughs> home as an eight month old Grant zebra okay. and uh it was a big project i mean people would come out you know my friends and you know my sisters and stuff would come out and watch me working with this animal and they're like you are crazy like you're gonna get yourself killed um <laughs> she was i mean she was pretty wild um at first and you know it was me learning at the same time um how to you know adjust my program and make it flexible enough to accommodate these guys um but she started doing really well um after that and uh now she does some really cool liberty performances she'll sit and lay down and the horses side pass over her and and all kinds of stuff so it's been pretty cool they're very interesting creatures i've definitely learned a lot that's pretty awesome that's pretty awesome and i've 
I've not done nearly that much with zebras. I've halter trained a couple young foals. But um, so for anybody out there listening, can you tell us maybe a little bit of how you found the zebras to be different than maybe handling the horses or um, the domestic horses or even the mustangs that you've worked with? Absolutely. So part of the show that I do, I actually go ahead and explain, you know, some of the differences genetically um, between a Mustang and a zebra. So, you know, some of these Mustangs have had about 500 years of natural selection type breeding, and the zebras have had millions um, evolving in Africa, um, like I said, for millions of years to survive the fiercest predators on earth and some of the harshest conditions. So they are hardwired to have incredibly strong instincts a bite that won't let go, a kick that can kill. Um, They're incredibly dangerous in the wrong hands. Um, I know several trainers who have been injured um, working with them. And then I believe, um, from what I've heard, they cause more injuries to the American zookeeper each year than any other animal, is um, a statistic that I saw. So um, they're basically... You know, uh, their flight instincts are heightened. So, I mean, they just go from zero to 100 and panic in the blink of an eye. They're kind of like a deer. I mean, imagine trying, you know, trying to train a deer or something with that kind of flight instinct. And then they also have a lot of fight, too. Um, So they're much quicker to kick, to bite, um, and they they don't hold any of that back. Um, And then um, finally, you know, depending on the species you're working with, um, they don't have as, as strong of a tendency to bond with one another. Um, the Grant zebra is a species who, um, who does have that tendency to bond, but like the Grevy zebra, for instance, their herds are much looser. Um, those stallions breed based on territory, not based on a uh, herd structure. Okay. So because of that, um, they're much less likely, well, they're, they don't have that glue that holds them together. Um, like the horses and the grant zebra do, um, because that, that glue holding the herd structure together is what allows them to mate and have offspring, but the grevy zebra rely more on territory. So um, depending on the species, you have that going too to further complicate things. Yeah. Um, so, and then also, you know, with that tendency to go into panic, well, then the other side of that is that they're actually very lazy because they want to always conserve that energy so that they can kick it up to 100 whenever they need to so they're kind of like a mix between a like aggressive donkey and a deer (laughs) okay right (laughs) right i was i was just going to mention that sounds sounds very similar to a lot of kind of the problem (laughs) donkeys or problem mules that i've worked with yeah 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 very cool very very cool that's awesome um so getting along the lines of kind of the challenges and the difficulties um, I know there was a video that went around, uh, I don't know, a while back, maybe last year or so, and, and refresh me if I'm wrong on that, with you with a three-strike Mustang. Uh, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, that would be Amira. Amira. And I got okay. her, yeah, I got her this fall and competed with her at Mustang Magic um, this past January. And, um, you know, it's always hard to say what your most difficult horse is because you're always learning new things, right? Right. um, But I really think that she has been the most difficult horse I've ever worked with, which a lot of people wouldn't think by watching her videos and how much progress she made um, and how I started her at Liberty and things. But she's very introverted. She just really didn't want anything to do with not just me, but other horses. Um, she had a tendency to really want to shut down, which um, I found is you know pretty common in those fearful introverts. And yes. so um, there'd be times where if you asked her for too much, she'd just totally shut down and have nothing for you. Um, so she's definitely been a big project, um, but it's made it all the more rewarding too to see how loyal and you know how willing she is now. Yeah. Fantastic. So um, you you reference her as being a three strike Mustang. What what does that mean exactly? Yeah. So basically, there is an amendment made um, when you know the Mustang population started kind of getting out of control. Um, that said, if a Mustang is is put up for adoption at three different events in a row and is not selected then um, they become sales authority horses or sales eligible. 
Um, so they are sold on the spot for $25 instead of the normal adoption fee of $125. The other main stipulation um, that is concerning, that can be concerning, is that generally when you adopt a Mustang, you have to hold their title for a year, yes. um, which really tends to uh, turn away, you know, kill buyers and stuff like that, at least upon the time of adoption. Um with these sales authority horses, it's much more likely that they end up there sooner. There is paperwork, of course, that they have to sign um, with the BLM, you know, saying that that's not going to happen. But um, once they're sold, there's really no way, you know, of of uh, keeping track of that. So um, a lot of them do end up going to slaughter. So um, that's what it means to, to be the three striker. And you can see, too, they're branded with a big U. Um, and so, uh, in her videos, it's pretty legible to see that big U as part of her brand. Yes. Right. Right. Interesting. Interesting. And so you, you said you started her at, uh, at Liberty. You have a, a Liberty start <laughs> program, right? Yeah. So she's kind of the one who, uh, got me started into that. So basically it all kind of happened honestly by accident. Um, I had started Mustangs and the gentling process both ways. I had done it online before, you know, well, you know, with a halter um, and then like load them in with a halter. And then, you know, you just kind of have to get close enough where you clip the lead rope and then you kind of have that line of attachment. Um, and then I've, I had started some too where I just didn't have anything on them. And generally, like especially for this competition, because I was working with a really busy schedule and I was on a limited time frame, I was going to have the halter put on in the holding pens and was kind of in a hurry that day, ended up actually forgetting my halter. And so when we were on the way back, um, they loaded, you know, they load them uh, into kind of catch pens and then shoe them into your trailer. Normally when they're in the catch pen, that's when they can flip the halter on for you. Yes. Um, but again, I forgot to do that. So we're heading back and I'm like, oh, I can't believe I forgot the halter. You know, I'm in this kind of event and I'm already busy and da 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 and I was like, you know, I'm just going to kind of see what I can do without the halter um, and see how long I can go without it. And after working with her for the first day or two, I was like, huh, I wonder, I wonder if it'd be possible to actually ride her without her ever even having a halter on. And the idea sounded completely crazy at first. Um, it and... sounds pretty brassy. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That that so, that almost and, sounds like a like a college guy bet. Like, hey man, hold my right, beer and exactly. watch this. <laughs> exactly, but it was just against myself, and I'll set these you know challenges for myself. And anyway, so as I started going, um, I actually started realizing what we could take away from the process to relate back to just our general cult starting um, methods because it's all about creating a mental connection with them because you don't have any ropes and then the second big thing is um that you're not denying their flight instinct at all so if you end up what i would call going over their threshold or asking them for more than they're ready for you don't risk uh causing any trauma or anything like that they simply go into that flight mode and then they'll start to interpret when they when they need to go into that flight mode and when they don't. Um, now, even if you don't do it at Liberty, you can still apply the same, a similar concept instead of, you know, um, holding them and kind of micromanaging them as you desensitizing them, as you're de desensitizing them, um, just sending that ex excess energy around um, so that they start, like I said, really interpreting um, what the cause to go into flight and what isn't, which is just as paramount to their survival as, as going into, into that flight. So it was pretty interesting everything I learned kind of taking um, taking away from it. And I actually really think that that's kind of what saved me with this horse because I think if I had gone more of a traditional route with her, um, she just, like I said, was such a difficult, um, such a difficult horse. I just don't know if that would have been as effective with her. Yeah. So, so um, that's interesting. That's really interesting. And it all kind of started by accident. And so now you have yeah. um, a, a, a program, basically. Yes. That you're, are, you, are you teaching this program, or, or how does that work? Well, um, I'm still kind of experimenting with it. Um, okay. So I went back home um, that fall after I started Amira, um, which then we kind of got into a predicament because my goal was to ride her 
in that first week walk track canner and you know doing some basic body control stuff in the arena which she did but then we were supposed to leave the next day and she still wasn't halter broke so she was halter broke <laughs> for maybe 24 hours and then we hauled you know about 17 hours across the country to go back home um okay but Anyways, um, when I got back, I started three domestically bred colts um, in the same way and had success with them, so I was feeling pretty good about it. And then this spring, um, this spring I had a Mustang that someone had given to me that had a very bad bolting issue, um, would sometimes buck as well, was just very reactive, could never relax. Um, would basically just want to run and bolt off as soon as you put a leg over. So I did um, a restart with him using all of, like, using the Liberty Start. Um, his name was Django, and um, it was effective with him as well, and he was super relaxed. And I just um, posted a progress video of him about a week ago, and that's kind of been the latest video that's going around. So for to see it work on not just a horse that's more of a clean slate, but also one that has had all of these issues uh, was really, really interesting. And, and what I found too was, again, by um, letting these horses make decisions um, on their own, once they make the decision not to bolt or not to go into that reaction, um, it holds a lot better than just micromanaging and, and forcing them to stay with you. So when it can be their decision, um, makes a, a big impact I found with him. And then also, um, again, kind of just talking about reading those thresholds um, and kind of making it more of a process of two-way communication um, is kind of what I talk about a lot in my program. So I'll give them different um, things to do, like to communicate their fear than a buck or a bolt. So like one being the hindquarter yield. So okay. I train them that if they're nervous, um, they just need to yield their hindquarters and I'm going to get off their back and walk away or I'm going to take that scary object away. And then eventually it's enough when you yield their hindquarters to just sit there and relax, you know, and rub or whatever. Um, and they return to a state of relaxation. But I don't expect, you know, to get on a horse for the first time and them not have any fear. Sure. And I also don't expect them to have fear, but me to not acknowledge it and say, suck it up, ride on anyways. Um, that's just not my style. So by giving them this tool to communicate their fear in a way that, is effective and safe for both of us, um, I found has been a huge game changer. And I learned that um, through another very difficult horse that I worked with. Um, that's kind of another story um, about a year. Let's see, it was about two years, no, about a year and a half ago. So um, I had a difficult horse that I was that I was working with. Wow, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so with the with the difficult horses, when you're when you're going through the Liberty Start, how do you find that to be different than with one that you've uh, kind of been starting from scratch? You know, one that's got the the history behind him and kind of the learned braciness. How do you feel that that's different than one that just has no point of reference yet? Oh, it's definitely. I'm sure as you found a million times harder trying to undo behavior that has been accidentally reinforced yes. or you know uh, whatever for years than starting with something blank for sure um and and you know also determining what kind of trauma is behind that and when i talk about trauma um i'm basically um referring to some some sort of trigger that sends them back in it's like they're reliving that original moment and it's so odd because it's, it's very similar to what you see in humans like with ptsd and stuff Absolutely. the horses are just so incredibly sensitive um being these prey animals and especially the mustangs and the zebras with these heightened instincts um it's just crazy what they will hold on to throughout their body and their mind um, and these triggers just send them back to relive that moment. So giving them the tools to work through that can be a big challenge. Um, and people, you know, ask me all the time. They tell me their horse's story and they see, they, you know, that all these awful stories. And they say, do you think that he can recover? Or, do you, you know, do you think he can be normal again or whatever? And um, I guess I just have a very positive outlook on things. But I believe anything is possible. It's just a matter of how much time and resources you're willing to put into those horses and whether, you know, the price is worth that, that outcome um, for both you and the horse. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a really big piece of that. There's, there's 
honestly just some owners that aren't um, willing or maybe I should even say in their current situation aren't able to right. offer those horses the amount of time that they need, you know. Sure. And um, and I like the way that you refer to that kind of as a PTSD uh, challenge. I refer to it a lot of times as their past life experiences. Yeah. Uh, and because it can very much seem that way. You know, it is. It's, it's something that happened in their life in the past. Um, but it's very real to them. And it can kind of form what I talk about as part of the horse's personal philosophy, you know, mm -hmm. where they, they develop a personal philosophy about life and about work and about the world right. in general, just like, you know, any of us would. Uh, exactly. And, and I do find that can be the biggest challenge is helping them to uh, readjust their personal right. philosophy. Right. And just with like with humans as well. And, and that's what I find, you know, really fascinating, too, about my work with horses is especially, um, you know, as I've had more experiences and meeting all these new people and things being on the road is how many similarities there are um, as far as, you know, how difficult it is for some people to break patterns and habits and things that they've been, been reinforced for their whole life. Um, just like these horses and, and, and like we talked about with the PTSD and things, there's so many parallels that um, I think that people can take from, from working with these horses. So it's really, it's, it's never really been um, just about the horses for me. It's about how can these horses help us be better as humans as well and in our relationships with people. So it's very important to me that the methods that I'm using with the horses are ways that I'd relate, you know, too with people as well not you know exactly in the same way but with the same morals and mind and things like that absolutely absolutely and i find i find that most of the time the human is probably a lot harder to change than than <laughs> what the horse is you know yeah. um, because boy when the horse finds that kind of breakthrough moment um uh, there's i i find them to be so much more honest about it you know and so much more right. willing to kind of stay there once they find it even if they have a harder time finding right. it but there's a lot of times i find that people kind of lie to themselves or they let themselves off the hook a lot so it makes them right. a lot more difficult to change than the horse um, absolutely yeah, which they're... is a big piece of this deal you know yeah and it's so interesting too um, to see how our horses mirror, um, you know, where we are at, um, at our, you know, the point in our lives that we're at. And um, what I found, too, you know, that's been a little bit difficult for me starting, you know, all this teaching and things. It's, I love teaching. Um, but sometimes you're at clinics and um, you see the way people are interacting with their horses is quite similar to the way they interact with other people um, yes. a lot of the time. So if they're kind of a very type A, go-getter, controlling um, personality, they're like that with their horses as well and very busy. And then for a person who, you know, has a lack of confidence, again, that shows up in their horses and they really mirror that. And um, so it's like a little bit difficult for me as a trainer because we're supposed to be talking about um, training courses. <laughs> right. But but the way we train horses is oftentimes how we treat other people. And then it goes even another level. It's a lot of times how you treat yourself too and how hard you are on yourself and, and things like that. It's definitely, there's so many dynamics to it. It's just, uh, I'm always learning. So. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And that brings up something that I'm, I'm hoping to get to a little bit later. You talked about how hard you are on yourself. Um, and <laughs> I had a reference made to me from a friend um, about a post or a, a short article that you had made not too long ago about uh, a recovering perfectionist. So a little bit later, oh. I'd love to talk about that a little bit if you're, yeah. if you're all right with that. Um, so you're out there teaching clinics now. When when you're teaching, do you have a primary focus uh, of what you're teaching? Are you trying to teach your basic program? Is it a problem solving? How does how does the clinic yeah. scene go for you? Yeah, so um, I'm getting more organized this year. Originally, when I started out, it was like, hey, come to my clinic. I'll teach you whatever you want to know. <laughs> you know, trying to get <laughs> uh -huh. people to come. Um, and which really turns into a balancing act when you have all these people in the arena and you're trying to do something separate with all of them. It's very difficult. So 
Um, basically, I'm offering a few different types of clinics, a horsemanship clinic, um, groundwork, and then riding. So groundwork is basic um, body control and communication um, on the ground. Um, and then under saddle is, you know, basic foundation work there. Um, uh, some more advanced stuff, although I'm still fine tuning my riding and things like that. And then um, I offer a Liberty Clinic, so teaching um, everything at Liberty, which is really what I, I love, love doing. Um, and then I also do a what I call girl racing naturally program, okay. uh, which is a, also a really fun clinic to teach. I've only taught two so far, one in Canada and one in Indiana. And um, those are always a lot of fun to do. But I, uh, before I got into the Mustangs, I rode barrel horses for years and um, tried to develop a program to get those horses running in a way that um, they stayed relaxed, um, but yet they were very competitive. That was kind of the main goal. Um, at one point, I took on a, a stud who, it, who was just really kind of blown up and things and, and was working through that. So I learned a lot through him. And anyways, I formulated a program for barrel racing. Um, that I teach with that. So those are the three main types of clinics I'm doing right now. And then I do demonstrations, you know, at various events with um, cold starting, problem horses, zebra behavior, um, and different things. But honestly, being on the road, uh, I really didn't know like what I was getting into. Um, and I sold all my barrel horses to go out on the road, um, sold my last really good one in the May before, May before I left. And it was just a struggle. It was always a struggle financially living from event to event. Yes. Um, you know, hoping people show up cause you need to get paid and then people <laughs> call at the last minute and cancel. And, you know, yeah. it's just, it's, it's been a struggle and also getting a team of people to help me with all of that. So. I've started moving a lot more to some online stuff, um, our membership program on Facebook with the live videos. And then this summer I've been filming my groundwork course and a Liberty one and two class that I plan to have online this fall or so. And then I also wrote a book um, on my five golden rules and we did a DVD for that. So I'm hoping to have more of that stuff available soon to kind of give me a more stable source of income, hopefully yes. to support what I'm doing with the Mustangs. So yeah. Absolutely. So um, you you alluded to five golden rules, and uh, I don't know about everybody else, but I'm not too familiar with that. Um, can you kind of give us a sneak peek about what those five yeah. rules are? You bet. So um, the five golden rules are something I've developed over the years with my work um, with the Mustangs and Zebras, as well as studying the work of other successful trainers. And um, I've always been a person who has to think in terms of a formula or a pattern. Um, and like even in school, um, I kind of changed majors a lot. And again, that's another story. But at one point <laughs> I was in pre-pharmacy which is a, you know, a very rigorous, um, uh, major. Yeah. So and I am, I definitely don't claim to be, you know, the smartest kid. So for me, it was all about how do I find a formula that'll help me be successful on these exams and things. So I would actually draw out these huge concept maps and I would look ridiculous. I'd be walking around campus with like this huge, like, kids like coloring books that I fill <laughs> with all these concept maps because then I could see everything and how everything worked together and when it came time for the exams um I would do really well like I they had a grading curve so I'd end up getting like 104 and all this stuff and friends like would look wow. at me and be like what are you doing because they would get so confused and they complain you know the professor never went over all this stuff well he didn't because it was an application um, you know, of the information. It wasn't, um, it didn't work for their memorization technique. So I decided to do something similar with horses. And I was actually, I had had a horse, a young horse slip in the snow and fall on me and break my leg. So I had six weeks off is when I really put this together and drew it out. And I came up with these five things that every successful training program kind of has in common, every scenario um, revolves around these five things. I tried really hard to come up with something that didn't involve those five things and was unsuccessful in that. And they allow for flexibility. So I've tested it with um, burrows, with zebras, with horses, any discipline, it doesn't matter, any breed of horse, um, because they allow for enough flexibility in the program. But for me, you know,
know, when we're out there working with our horses, we need to learn how to apply information, not how to memorize, you know, 300 scenarios. That's, I mean, overwhelming and impossible to do right. um, most of the time. So um, for me, it, it really kind of put any everything um made everything click and it was very easy to teach people people could catch on sooner because they were more aware of what they were doing so the first rules the first two rules focus on motivation um how do we get the horse to see you know what's in it for them and then the last three focus on communication they have to know what we're asking them to do um so if you can get your horse um if you can get them to be motivated and you can have clear communication I mean, it doesn't matter if you're going out to win a barrel race, a uh, raining show, you know, jump, whatever it is. Um, those things are, are highly important. So That's pretty cool. Okay, awesome. Are you going to, are you going to like tell us what these five golden rules are? <laughs> I mean, you got me on the edge um, of my seat here, girl. Damn it. Yeah. Give us a... Give... <laughs> um, so... Let's see. So uh, the first rule is um, all about um, using reinforcement to reward our horses. And um, basically, you know, a lot of people think that when even when a horse like um, offers an unwanted behavior, that there's going to be punishment. And for my program, it's all about reinforcing the wanted behavior so that the unwanted behavior dissipates. Um, that does, doesn't doesn't mean I won't go into defense if a horse were to come at me or something, but that's very mm-hmm. different than going into offense and you know offering punishment. Right. So um, it's based on reinforcement, and I explore the two different types of reinforcement, both um, positive and negative. And mm-hmm. I kind of um, look at um, you know the basis is negative reinforcement for my program because looking at what motivates your horse well they're first motivated by safety and comfort before they're even you know interested in food they're not going to compensate their safety and comfort to get a treat right um right. so the program is based on negative reinforcement but when i started working with the zebras um i worked with Zena for the first almost year just using negative reinforcement and one day i, I decided you know what i'm going to give this positive reinforcement thing a go um, I had had a really um, negative view on it because I had always been told, well, you're bribing your horse, you're going to create a pocket crazy horse, um, yeah. you're going to create a disrespectful horse and all this stuff. And what I learned was it's not positive reinforcement that's bad, it's the way we've applied it. And so if we can use it in a way that just supplements our negative reinforcement, it actually makes those releases more powerful. Yes. And um, it can have a lot of implications for horses who have been through trauma, Um, horses like Amira who tend to shut down. Because if you're limiting yourself to just one way of motivating your horse, you're going to have to use more of that motivator to get the response you want. And sometimes you're having to use so much pressure. It's like, you know, a lot of people don't feel comfortable with that even. Um, And and, um, it just, you know, once you're just constantly adding pressure, the horse starts to give up, and that's when they go into that shutdown mode. So if you can add in another motivator, you don't have to use as much pressure either. Um, so I've definitely been experimenting with that, and I really just kind of found that if you're limiting yourself to just negative reinforcement, it's kind of like um, a guy, you know, a fix-it man who comes to your house and sets down a toolbox, and he takes out, you know, one tool. And, um, you know, you can pound a nail into the wall with a, you know, a wrench, but it's not right. going to be the most effective one to get you there. Right. So sure. um, that's just one of kind of the rules. Um, and then I have all five available on my Facebook group on the membership site. Um, but then, like I said, the second one deals with another way to motivate our horses, um, kind of what I would call like the win-win situation. Um kind of redirecting excess energy and then the last three dealing specifically with communication um so those are available um on the membership site as well gotcha. um, and then that's what i just got done writing the book on oh, so okay. um yeah so that was really um exciting to have that done so i still have to edit it but the meat is all there so. awesome awesome so uh gang listeners out there uh, if you want to know maddie's five golden rules unfortunately as much prying as I'm trying to do, she's just not giving it up, guys. This chick is tough. So you're going to just have to buy her friggin' book when it comes out, which is okay. That's awesome. That's cool. Um, and, and I totally respect that. Um, that doesn't mean that this interview is going to get any easier. I'm just saying that I respect that. That's all. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh goodness. So, uh, so you mentioned, and and I again, I really respect you for this, for kind of diving into the uh, online learning and the video learning and that sort of thing. Um, you mentioned the idea of the clinics. You know, sometimes people cancel last minute, and you're kind of scraping pennies probably for the next meal. I know exactly what that's like because I live on the road teaching clinics basically seven days a week. Um, wow. <laughs> so uh, life as a clinician and a performer, as you know, it's not like I have to tell you, um, is, is pretty hectic uh, and sometimes yeah. can be kind of scary when you get those cancellations or you get the contracts that don't come through and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, without maybe getting too personal or maybe with, I don't know, um, how do you handle that? Absolutely. So um, I definitely always kind of have the mindset that there's 100 hours in every day. And um, for me, the past few years, um, you know, when I got out of college, I thought, finally, I'm out of school. You know, I'm going to have plenty of time to do all of these things. And um, it totally was not the case. I got more busy than ever. And it's like you spread yourself so thin that the quality of your work starts deteriorating, too. And um, when I sent out, when I set out on the road, I was going to teach clinics, and I was also going to perform. And I found it to be a huge struggle to get a team of horses ready because it's not like I'm performing with one horse, right? It's sure, four mustangs right. and a zebra. Right. Um, so I have to get them ready, and then I also have to be teaching, which takes a lot of energy, um, you know, as you know. And I'm actually naturally very introverted, um, but I'm just so passionate about horses that, as you can see, I could talk all day about them. Right. Um, but it, it really does, you know, take a lot out of you. And so um, then I added, you know, now I have five Mustangs on the road and two zebras. And I think back to the days where I had four Mustangs and one zebra, and I'm like, oh, that was so easy. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, yeah, so that's another reason, you know, I'm trying to do more stuff online. But, you know, as far as um, dealing with it and different things that I do to deal with it, um, I really just kind of, it got to the point for me, like, my body couldn't keep up with it. I was making stupid, you know, like, mistakes from being tired and worn out and physically and mentally drained that I started having injuries. And um, I hurt my back. Um, it was about a year ago now, and that was kind of a wake up call for me. Like, okay, you need to, um, really look at, first of all, why do you feel like you have to keep yourself? I mean, so incredibly busy, um, and, um, really try to develop a way that would allow me more freedom, um, which is, you know, what I've done, you know, with the online stuff that I'm trying to do. And so I guess like for me, when I come into a problem, which I really um, uh, kind of give a lot to my parents for this, but when I encounter a problem, I'm always looking for, okay, what's the solution? What can I do to get out of this um, or to recover from this? Or what can I learn from it? That's a big thing. I mean, like, I think everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, for the most part, it's not really gotten me too down it's more just like okay what am I gonna do to make this better how can I make this better and I'm like I said always trying to learn and um you know from other people and things so whenever I'm driving if I'm not on the phone you know taking care of business things or talking to family um I listen to audiobooks um on okay. ways to run a business on self-improvement and self-growth and all those kinds of things and um that has been huge for me to, you know, explore new solutions and, okay, how am I, you know, going to get through some of these different things? So reading has always been a huge thing for me and um, to be able to explore all those different ideas has been huge. So That's awesome. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, so getting into the business, um, it's it seemed like, at least to me, uh, I know we've kind of been, you know, chatting online a little bit for, what, the last maybe two years, trying, yeah. seems like we tend to cross paths going through the Midwest, and we never um, are in a situation <laughs> to actually catch each other at a clinic or at a venue, um, right. but we're, we're always sort of crossing through there. So it just seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems to me like, Fairly recently, the last year or so, you've gotten quite a bit of uh, fame and recognition for what you're doing. 
<laughs> uh, yeah. Which is uh, great to see. And, of course, I know it always seems like, you know, everybody says, oh, you know, overnight success and all that garbage, right? It's, it's crap. <laughs> 20 years of hard work to become an overnight success. Um, right. But as, as a young female – trying to run this business and and I don't want to I don't want to make this sound like a sexist question at all but as oh, a young yeah. female trying to run a business uh, trying to hit the road and be a clinician and teach people and all that stuff uh, how do you feel about that do you feel that this industry this <laughs> business is maybe a little tougher for women especially younger women like yourself or how do you feel about that yeah so there's yeah I could talk a lot about this too um <laughs> So basically, like for me, as far as, you know, people starting to recognize my work and things, um, it's been great in the sense that now I feel like I can talk to someone and have a source of credibility. Whereas before, you know, I was, you know, some little, you know, blonde girl out working horses and, you know, whatever. Um, and um, so it's been nice, you know, to have, you know, some credibility so that, you know, you have more respect and things like that. Um you know, on a on a lighter note, it is very funny to see people's reactions when I, um, you know, like pull into gas stations and stuff with my trailer because my rig is, you know, a six foot or a six foot six horse uh, trailer with living quarters. It's almost forty foot long, and um, guys especially will take double looks all the time. Like, sure. And one time we were filling up our generator. Um, me, uh, we being uh, me and my friend Allie, who was working with me on the road for a little bit. We were filling up the generator, which requires gas. And the guy came up to us and he was like, you know that truck's diesel, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I think I got it, buddy. Thanks. <laughs> um, so it's definitely a lot of double take when they see, you know, someone out my age traveling alone. I'm either usually traveling alone or traveling with another um, young woman who, you know, is interested in learning from me, um, which is awesome to have. Right now I have Claire Walsh, who's another successful Mustang trainer herself. Um, but it definitely, you know, you've got to be always kind of my mom. I always make fun of her for saying this, but I'm going to quote her. Mm -hmm. you got to keep your head on a swivel. I mean, it's, you know, you're pulling into gas stations late at night. Um, you're, you know, dealing with a lot of different people. Um, so, I mean, just the safety component too. I mean, at first my dad just about lost it when I said I was going on the road, but sure. I think after the zebra, especially, they kind of learned that I'm a little bit strong willed. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, but, um, you know, and as far as the industry, um, I feel like, um, you know, you made a good point. It's not that we're being sexist. It's just that there's different, you know, you respond to different ways. There's different gender roles and things like that. And um, I do think, my opinion from my experience, is that some guys find it a little threatening if you're a girl and you show up and you do end up doing well. Um, and I've had comments made to me before. Like, I remember my first Extreme Mustang makeover, a guy came up to us um, and was asking my friend who was with me at the time, you know, what man was behind her, what man helped her train that horse. She didn't train. I don't believe that she didn't train that horse on her own and wow. you know, all this stuff. And it's like, you know, and, and it's, it's hard, but you definitely, you have to let go of people having their own opinions because they are wrapped up in their own story a lot of the time. Yes. And, um, you know, letting that go has been huge. I mean, even posting, you know, the videos, when you start getting a lot of comments, I really don't read through them anymore um, because it's too hard to, to pour your heart and soul and your total passion into this to try to make something like better and bring something better to the world and po something really positive to still have people, you know, throwing in, you know, whatever. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I've definitely definitely run into that and when people feel threatened that's definitely when they tend to lash out yes. um so for the most part everyone's been really great but i've definitely had encounters that um have um you know definitely shown a little bit of light on how it may be you know different um for a female in the industry and i don't have a lot of guys come to the clinics the guys who i have had have been awesome Good. um but i feel like you know uh me being a girl too i don't know if that makes it a little bit weird for i don't know for them to sign up and learn from a 23 year old girl um if they're you know an old 
you know, cowboys have been doing this for years. <laughs> right, um, right. I can see, you know, we have lots of male auditors, so maybe they're just kind of standing on the sidelines right now and kind of seeing what it's about. Um, gotcha. Well, if yeah, it makes you feel any better, um, this August will be 17 years that I've been teaching clinics. And mm-hmm. I think I've had about that many guys show up to my clinics really? throughout the oh, years. Wow. Prob- I mean, it's it's got to be 20 or less anyway, without yeah. a doubt. So, um, so, so you're not unique in that. You know, it's definitely yeah. – uh, the women definitely outnumber the men as far as the student ratio goes. Um, sure. And I've had – all the men have been great, you know, but the, the ratio of men is very, very small – in my experience also. Yeah, and I think, you know, a lot of that, too, goes with the cultural, I mean, this is kind of getting a little bit deep, I don't know how deep you want to think of it, with our cultural norms and beliefs and things, we put a lot of pressure on men to, um, you know, figure it out themselves, and if they need help, well, that's weakness and things like that, so I have found that women, you know, depending on how they were raised, tend to be more open in receiving help and things like that. Now, me, I think that's something I'm really working on is accepting help from people and realizing <laughs> I don't have to do everything on my own. Right, um, right. But just as a kind of a broad, you know, overlook, that's kind of what I found. So I, I'm sure that that is probably part of it too, hey? Eh? Right, absolutely. Well, and, you know, like you said, you have a hard time kind of accepting help from other people. You're, you're you know, as a broad overview, you're kind of a different kind of broad out there, right? Uh, you know, sort of sort of tough as nails, taking the bull by the horns and handling it yourself, you know? I mean, I and I guess I kind of assumed that you had, you know, some other people on the road with you and that you weren't on the road solo most of the time. Uh, I know I've pulled it, and maybe this is, maybe I shouldn't, this is oversharing on my part, but I mean, I've seen some pretty seedy stuff happen outside of hotel rooms that I've been at and and truck stops that I've visited on the way, and I mean, I'm just traveling, okay, I'm going to admit this to you, Maddie, and, and this is just you and I talking on the phone, but I drive around in a Prius, right? So uh, yeah. there you are hauling down the road with a six horse and I'm pulling in with a Prius, right? So, <laughs> um, so just that right there, you know, your brass is heavier than mine. That's, that's what it comes down to. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I've seen some pretty wild stuff happen, you know, uh, going yeah. down the road. So it, it does take a lot of brass to be out there solo, uh, you know, doing that. So, I mean, I give you a lot of credit. I I commend you for for doing that. Well, thank you. And, you know, normally, most of the time, I'm staying with, you know, host family, if you have me, who have all been, like, awesome. But I have been starting to fly a little bit more, and especially with the hotel situation. I was in Arizona this winter and stayed, like, downtown Phoenix. And quickly learned that that was probably not like a good idea. <laughs> I was like, honestly, that is the one night I've been really terrified. Yeah. I was by myself in this motel room, and there were like all these guys walking by, and I don't even know doing whatever, and like pounding on my door because I think they had the wrong room, and my heart just stopped, and I was like, oh, oh god, man. oh god, <laughs> wow. <Please." laughs> yeah. So it's been interesting. You definitely learn uh, those places not to go. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Wow. That's, that's it. Life on the road is interesting, you know? It is. And I think, you know, a lot of people look at it and they see what I'm doing. They're like, oh, I'd love to do that. And yeah, I wouldn't give this up for anything, but they don't see everything that goes into making it work. Um, It's definitely not all sunshine and, and daisies. I mean... And that's the thing, too, even about finding help is, um, you know, people with Geiger, and it's, it's hard work. Right. Um, and I've, I've been fortunate to have some really good help. But, um, you know, it's it's always a struggle because people just don't quite, um, you know, and through social media and things like that, we really think we understand what's going on, but we're only seeing one side of it. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So, people get yeah. to see the, the glitz and the glamour, and so it seems like such – a a glamorous life traveling around seeing new places meeting new people but it's i know i find this as well it's uh it's not often that people actually kind of understand how stressful that can be and how difficult that is being on the road all the time chasing kind of chasing your paycheck instead of instead of sort of having a steady job to to bring that um 
and that takes a lot so that that'll maybe put us into a kind of a different segment of this that takes a toll on a lot of personal relationships and a lot of family relationships um so how do you handle that it definitely does i mean it's a lot of missed birthday parties and graduations and weddings and you know all of that stuff and um gosh um you know i think honestly um going out on the road at first um i almost wanted to make myself more distant you know i had a lot of um, relationships in the past that didn't end up so well and stuff and um but you realize you know you definitely don't want to live your life on the run you know too scared of opening yourself up and um committing to relationships and stuff like that um with my family now i'm lucky that my family is very mobile my dad loves traveling um and so they've been completely like so supportive of what i'm doing and will come visit me at some of my shows and stuff and then when i'm in colorado I'm right next to them. My dad thinks it's awesome that he can like drive over to where I am. Oh, that's great. <laughs> uh, to, to get a hold of me. Yeah. So, um, it's been, it's been awesome being so close to them, but at the same time, I've been so busy. I really haven't had a lot of time this summer, um, filming when I was home to, to really spend with them. Um, but yeah, luckily they're able to be pretty mobile and, um, meet up with me at some of these places and um of course we you know we talk on the phone and stuff and i've always been the person as far as um friendships and stuff like that um kind of back to me you know being more introverted i have a few like two or three really close friends that it doesn't matter you know if we don't see each other for a year like we'll still pick up right where we left off and we're still there to support each other so um that's always good i definitely don't have like a wide circle of people that i'm constantly trying to um keep in touch with so yeah yeah. Cool. So, um, so I remember a video that you posted. I believe it was a, a live Facebook video last fall. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so oh, geez. After magic. Yeah. After, the, yeah, <laughs> after that yeah. Mustang magic I, deal. And I um, sat there forever trying to do that. It was nerve wracking. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, I remember seeing you kind of in tears, not kind of, you uh, seeing you in tears going <laughs> going over this video and talking about just kind of how you had worked so hard up to that point, and now it, it was at that point, and now, uh, well, yeah. take us take us back to that if you can. Yeah. Or so, tell me to go to hell and just leave it alone. That's cool, too. No, <laughs> no. I, it's very important to me, you know, that I talk about these things. And, you know, kind of going back to me always trying to kind of be independent and do everything on my own, I definitely not wanted to show anyone my emotions. And if I'm hurting, I keep it to myself. I suck it up. I'm like a zebra, you know? Right. <laughs> like a little better. And so, um, but again, I learned, you know living life like the human life is all about experiencing those emotions and if i can you know if i'm on a platform now where i'm communicating with a lot of different people then it's important not just for myself but for others that i lead by example of being open and showing those vulnerabilities um to show other people that a this isn't the perfect world it's very easy to think that um you know when things go wrong you're alone and you're not and if we can all be willing to open up and share that, I think that we'd have a lot more support with each other. So, you know, that was one of the main reasons that I wanted to do it. Cause I looked, I did, I looked at that phone and I'm like, what am I doing? I can't do this. I can't do this. There's so many people <laughs> on Facebook, you know? And I was like, right. but you have to, you have to show people what goes on behind the scenes and that I'm going through the same struggles as, you know, whoever else that is doing this or, or doing whatever that they're doing is. And so that was really important to me. And um, basically what I was talking about in the video is, you know, you, it gets kind of complicated because you start, you can, you can get really reinforced and rewarded for making achievements and you start to develop a dangerous belief system that you are what you achieve. And for me, you know, Mustang Magic was super emotional. It was nerve wracking as hell going in there. Um, but it was a huge accomplishment for me, just a, out of a personal growth standpoint. Um, and then, of course, we ended up winning, which was also very awesome. Um, but once you get that high, and then you kind of come back to reality. And 
oh my gosh, I'm so behind in all this office work, you know, I have all these bills due, and you're like jolted back to reality after having a really big high. Yeah. And um, also, you know, going back to the tying your happiness to achievements, um, that can be dangerous too, because once you achieve something, you're like, oh, now I'll be happy. And then you're like, oh, you know, there's all this stuff I still have to deal with and things like that. So, it, you know, there's a lot of different stuff going on that I that I wanted to share with people. And um, I hope that I continue to be able to do that, to just be very open and, you know, just real about everything and, and hopes that that'll help other people too. Right, right. Well, and that ties us into that idea of uh, what you have called beautifully imperfect. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to kind of take us to that post that you made uh, the 12th of July this year. Um, and, and you said in there exactly what you said here. I am what I accomplish and how well I accomplish it. Uh, and if I can kind of read a little from the post and the perfectionist is born. We live our lives yeah. lost in a dizzying cycle. Please perform and perfect. And then you go on to talk about, you know, the truth about perfection not being attainable and wasting our lives searching for something we'll never find uh, and then being able to let go of that you are enough you're not defined by your achievements uh, and you can't make the whole world happy but you can be real so was that kind of the the event that sort of chucked you into that mindset or how did you how did you find a way to let go of that perfectionist or or did you well, really <laughs> yeah, right. So it's definitely like that's you know, and I really believe that true change happens over time. That's why we kind of, you know, give relatives a hard time if they come back, you know, after a summer of being away and they're a changed person or whatever. Um, and so it's definitely something that I have to work on every day because it's so ingrained in me. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons that my life has gotten a bit out of control in the sense of just how incredibly busy it is. I have way too much going on because I constantly think I have to do this or I, I do that, you know, um, and I really digging deep and getting to the core of it. You look at a lot of values, you know, you have about yourself and things like that. And um, just looking at horses, for instance, um, you know, when I got into horses, well, it wasn't enough. You know, you're not a good enough horse trainer if you just, you know, work with green horses. Well, it's not enough that you're starting colts, you know. So then you do the two-day or, you know, whatever, two-day colt starting challenges I did in three and a half hours. And, you know, well, it's not enough that you're doing that. You have to start a wild horse. And then, no, oh, it's not enough. You have to do a zebra. And then, no, oh, it's not enough. You have to do, you know, a horse, like a wild horse at Liberty and all this stuff. And, you know, those things can be great if they're for the right reasons. But for me... I think, you know, initially, especially, it was about, I never felt like I was good enough. I never felt like I was a good enough trainer. So maybe once I train this wild zebra, finally, I'll be good enough for myself. And you're always working towards this, exactly that level of perfection that you can't possibly reach. And then you waste your whole life trying to get there. And um, it's just, you know, seeing too, like the big thing for me, honestly, was seeing my little sister and saying, you know what? I really don't want her going through the hardest years of her life in high school thinking she has to be perfect and, you know, that she has to lose weight to be pretty and that she has to do all of these things to be enough. And um, so for me, it was like, I, I think that some of that change was inspired not just for myself, but for others. Um, around me and um, for all the young I mean men and women but especially young women I mean there's a lot of pressure on them to be to be perfect and nice and you know all these things that right. that we um, hold them up to and so um, you know I'm definitely working on that whole I hate even saying it that self-love thing you know uh -huh. um, but I, I think that a lot of that change can be in Inspired by caring for someone else and then as you practice it you can start applying it you know okay I'm doing this to better myself um but I've definitely gone through experiences in my life that have um really made that a challenge um so yeah that's kind of a little bit about that <laughs> yeah boy and and in the end aren't those the challenges that are the most meaningful though too you know 
It is. Yeah. And it's so interesting too. I, you know, one of those reasons that I like to write those posts is not just to share with other people what I'm learning and my experiences, but also because writing is how I work things out in my mind. So I've been trying uh, to that's keep your like outlet. A, yeah, exactly. So I've been trying to keep a journal this year and just write through things instead of, you know, sucking up and eating a cinnamon roll or something, you know, <laughs> um, and try not to express it. Um, so yeah, that's been huge for me is writing it out. And what I've kind of started discovering is, you know, we we're talking earlier about how much we can take from the horses. And I now have six horses, five are on the road with me right now because my trailer just isn't big enough. But each one of them has taught me a lesson for myself. And I'm actually starting another book called The Six Mustang Mirrors of how these wild horses have taught me um like what i would call self-truth um and uh so they've been huge especially amira and i think a lot of people relate to amira when i talk about her because she has that tendency to, to dissociate and shut down people have the exact same thing and i can't tell you how many times i've done that when you start to feel vulnerable and you start to feel an emotion that puts you at risk you shut yourself down because you don't want to feel that and Absolutely. um I, you can't selectively numb feelings. You can't say, I want to feel, you know, I want to feel joy and happiness and love. And I don't want to feel anger and sadness and frustration. It doesn't work that way. If you numb one, you numb them, and then you numb them all. And that's no quality of life. So it's definitely something I'm trying to actively work on. And the horses have really helped me put it um, into perspective by almost acting as a mirror of what I'm working on in that sense. Yeah, because, boy, they'll sure bring all of those emotions out, won't they? Yeah, yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, for sure. Awesome, awesome. So, um, just a quick little intersect here, gang. If you are listening to us live, please feel free check in. Let us know who you are, where you're from. Uh, give us some comments in the comment section below this live broadcast. And here in a bit, if we've got some time, if Maddie's not pressed for time, we're going to open the floor maybe to some questions. So feel free, enter some of your questions into the comment section below this audio. And also feel free to share this and invite your friends, tag them, uh, get them to join along in the conversation as well. Getting back to this, uh, I am Patrick King. We are talking about horses, uh, talking about Mustangs, zebras, and life on the road, actually, with Maddie <laughs> Shambaugh, Mustang Maddie. And this is this is awesome, Maddie. Thank you so much uh, for you know making the time to do this call with me and to put yourself out there because I know I'm kind of throwing some some grinding <laughs> questions at you, you know. Um, but I think it's important for us to be able to kind of talk about you know who we really are and and who people don't always get to see behind the mask, right? Because you're teaching a clinic Absolutely. and you're out there in front of thousands of people and you've got to smile and you've got to, you know, be right. that light. And, and I'm sure you find that for a lot of people, you've got to be that positive thing because they're turning to you for that, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So exactly. at the end of the day, when the horses are put up, the microphone's turned off, uh, you know, clinic attendees leave, who is Maddie Shambaugh? <laughs> uh, shoot, that's a good question. Um, well, it's really hard for me to put everything away because, like, once I get done working horses, which, first of all, if I'm teaching a clinic and then I'm working horses afterwards, it gets pretty darn late. Yeah. So by the time I crawl into bed, I'm about dead tired. But, um, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of other stuff, you know, like with the business and all the marketing and event planning and um, you know, the online store and education and it's, you know, just so much stuff that, that goes on it. I don't have a lot of spare time. Um, but, uh, when I do, well, that also makes it difficult because then I try to learn more about what I'm doing. Right. Um, but, um, aside from that, um, you know, I just, as far as, you know, like just things I like doing, I, I love, skiing for one my dad's a big skier we grew up skiing so i love that i love scuba awesome. diving um pretty much anything outdoors and nature type stuff um i'm all over it, but again time has been pretty limited for that but i don't know i've always been horse crazy um it's i'm a little bit obsessed you could definitely say that um <laughs> i eat sleep breathe live horses and um i, I wouldn't have it any other way but that's awesome that's awesome. Fantastic. 
Fantastic. Um, cool. Okay, so let's see. I think I'm gonna. Yeah, gonna. I'm, I'm rolling through some of these questions here that I had written up because we've kind of gone off on some tangents, which are awesome. I think that's what makes this stuff so much fun. But so, what what would you say is your vision for the future of your business? That's a good question. Um, it's kind of funny because we were going past Colorado State University earlier. And I went there my first semester of school, and we passed the arena I'd always work horses in. And at that point, I thought I was going to be a professional barrel racer, you know, trainer and stuff like that. And it's so weird how everything happens and turns out. Um, I never could have imagined I'd be going down the road with, you know, all these Mustangs and Zebras and things. Um, so it's always hard to determine where it's going to go. But um, as far as for what I can tell you, um, my plan is to, like I said, make this education more available to people. I really want to work with technology to bring horsemanship into the lives of people in a way that's hopefully easier and more effective than ever before as far as the information goes. Obviously, it's still an app, a game of application, um, but just as far as having that information available and things like that, I'm really excited for. Um, so definitely continue with the education, um, those books that I'm working on writing. And, um, you know, still developing my team of horses. Um, I'm really um, happy with how they're doing at Liberty. Um, there's always absolutely room for improvement. But this next year, I want to kind of focus more on my riding um, and kind of developing these Mustangs um, into kind of ambassadors for some various um, performance type stuff. So I have two that I'm working on some reining stuff with. Um, I have one who I have started barrel racing, and then I have one picked out um, for some dressage work, actually, Patrick. Nice. Um, yeah, so I just kind of want to spend the next year or, you know, well, I mean, it's an ever, it's a never-ending process, but really dive into the riding part and um, go out and, and ride with people and learn kind of the discipline-specific type um, things and um, also – um do some more i really like filming um like if it's like a vlog that i'm making that i just started doing like a video blog or you know some way of letting people in and really seeing what's going on and what it's like and um being a part of this kind of experience with me and getting the mustangs out on a larger platform um raising awareness for them um in that sense um for sure and just hoping to inspire people I mean in whatever ways that I can to go out and it may not be horses that they're crazy about but whatever it is that makes them crazy that they go to bed thinking about at night that they absolutely love taking the risk to go after that and um really live wholeheartedly in that sense so who knows where that will go um as far as you know the filming and, and that kind of stuff um, pretty exciting. So. That's very cool. That's very cool. So you you kind of um, went into a couple other questions that I was going to ask you. So you've been doing a new vlog. Yeah, I just started it, and I'm hoping that I'm going to keep with it. We actually <laughs> just did another we did another filming session today. But I really just want to you know how we were talking about earlier. Social media can be so one dimensional. They see kind of one side of you. I really want to invite people into my life, basically, yeah. to see what an average day is like and to learn in the process, learn more about the Mustangs or horse training or, you know, life lessons I've learned or the zebras and things like that. Um, and so the vlog is like a fun way of doing it. It's definitely some of the easier editing I've done. Um, and I just got like a GoPro, so it's really easy for me to just like strap it onto my head. I look retarded, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it works really well because um, I can be hands free and give people a whole new perspective of what I'm doing. Um, and so that's yeah, something I'm gonna try to do weekly. That's a little ambitious. We'll see, yeah. um, but absolutely monthly um, and putting something like that together, just so that people can really see kind of the whole picture and um, aren't focusing on just one you know one aspect of it. So. Right, right. That's very cool, and it is it is pretty ambitious to want to do it weekly. <laughs> it's you know that that's something that. It, yeah gosh, time to do these extra things, right? Because you're busy enough with the horses and the zebras and the, you know, the traveling on the road and the teaching the clinics. Um, <laughs> finding the extra time 
is really difficult. I know I've I've been doing for the last well now seven months. I've been doing what I've called my almost daily question and answer live videos, and oh, wow. you know we're half a year into it, and I've only got about a hundred uh, of the videos done. So it's not a daily thing, but I tell folks it's almost daily. Um, yeah. And, and basically, what it comes down to is there's places where I don't have reception to to be on, you know, Wi-Fi or anything like that. Um, sure. And it's hard, like you said, at the end of the day, gosh, you're you're done with the horses, you're done with teaching. At the end of the day, you're just dead to the world practically. Right. You know? So it can be kind of tough. Uh, I know for me, I've found it kind of exciting. You know, so I kind of think of it as a, you know, a side game or a side hustle, whatever you want to call it. Uh, where, you know, I enjoy it so much and it's energizing for me to be able to do it. But, you know, in the end, the time is is pretty difficult. And so that's where this idea with the weekly uh, audio broadcasts came from. You know, it's finding the opportunity to spend, uh, you know, one day a week with folks like you, you know, and, and other horsemen and horsewomen around the country and, and that sort of thing. But, gosh, coordinating everybody's schedules can sure be tough. So, yeah, um, but it is so much fun, you know, and it goes to what you said about, you know, being able to connect with other people and learn from others and that sort of thing. Right. And, I mean, gosh, I won't lie. Selfishly, you and I have been sending, you know, messages back and forth over Facebook saying, hey, where are you going to be? You know, we're passing through right. and we haven't had a chance to get together and talk in in any capacity. So, you know, I'm kind of selfish. I've got this chance to talk <laughs> with you and I'm just sharing it with the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah, well, the live videos are so awesome because first of all, it takes the editing out. But second of all, there's an added benefit of people, you know, being able to experience things in real time with you and interact more. And I'm really excited to see how the whole live video thing works, you know, as different clinicians and um, horsemen and women take advantage of using this as a tool to collaborate and share information. And for, you know, our Facebook group where we have my, my live training videos and stuff and Q and A's and stuff, it's just, it's been really neat to interact with those people and um, do things in real time, which is easier for me and adds an added value to them so that they can see, you know, nothing's uncut. It's all very raw, very real. Right. We're not editing anything out to make us look better as trainers, you know, when we get a hard horse or whatever. So, <laughs> yeah, for sure. There, there's, there's definitely a vulnerability to it. You know? Yeah, yeah, that three, two, one countdown to go right. live. Oh my gosh! Like, okay, we're going. Exactly, exactly. I can't tell you how many times I've sat down to that live video three, two, one countdown and thought, "Man, I've got a dry mouth. I need to take a drink of water." Yeah. Or, "Geez, right. I should have hit the restroom before I did this," or something. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like yeah, it's kind of daunting. At right. First, especially like. When I do live Q and A's like on my Facebook group, it's small enough where I kind of like am familiar with people and stuff, but um, I haven't done a lot of live videos on my actual main page just because it is a little I mean it is a little daunting. I hope to, you know, make time to take advantage of that in the future and talk to more people on there. But yeah, it's uh it's uh definitely I mean you're putting you're definitely putting yourself out there. So. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well and I like what you said, you know, about the collaboration and and that's always been a big thing for me for years i've done collaborative clinics i've you know i've i've actually been fortunate enough to train or to teach with some of my coaches as well you know i've taught clinics with mark russell taught clinics um i taught a clinic i think it was two years ago with john lyons and folks like that the collaboration is so so important um so i'm gonna kind of put us into some sort of random questions here if you could ride with anyone, speaking of collaboration, right? If you could ride with anyone, past or present, who would it be? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, uh, um, I mean, there's a lot that come to mind. Um, and I mean, just even thinking about how far back that you could go, you know, like, um, I find like uh, Native American culture like fascinating and to see how they worked with those horses, like to train them for buffalo hunts and stuff. I mean, without even having, you know, like the tack and the equipment that we have now, I find that fascinating, but I mean, that might be a little out there. But as far as like, you know, more recently, like obviously it would be great to have had the chance to ride, um, you know, with some of the 
uh, horsemanship celebrities like um, Ray Hunt and Tom Dorrance and things like that. I think that that would be pretty cool. Um, And I'm just really, honestly, like becoming familiar with all of the like performance writers out there. Um, But I can tell you, like people I've looked up to, um, two people come to mind would be uh, Stacey Westfall and Guy McLean. Both of those both of those people to me have demonstrated not only amazing horsemanship and dedication, but there's in my experience with them. And, you know, I don't know them personally. I'd love to, um, but it just seems to me like they are so real and so passionate about what they do. And um, I was watching Guy McLean at a show. uh, Where were we? Midwest horse fair maybe not this past year but the following uh or the one before that I mean the previous and um he really just like I don't know I was just like hit with tears watching him because it's so refreshing to see someone out there in the horse industry who is there for the horse and who is trying to unify you know everyone together instead of um you know kind of placing into this group well I ride English or I ride Western or you know whatever um so I mean those two people especially have really um just been huge role models for me and Stacey Westfall has been really supportive she shared my first Mustang makeover video that I did and that's really what got people kind of learning about what I was doing I mean no one knew who I was I had I taught a clinic the year before that and I had to like round people up to get three people to come to my clinic <laughs> and after I did that ride and she shared that video um I just like had a huge waiting list the next year like it was awesome and like for me people who are really in it for the horse you know going back to collaboration love collaborating love sharing information love supporting each other and that's what it should be about I mean um the way I see it um and so those those two people have been absolutely huge for me that's awesome that's awesome and they are great folks guy has been a friend of mine for many years and uh stacy also i just just met her uh, actually at the midwest horse fair i believe the midwest horse fair that you're referring to so they that's were both awesome. there yeah. i was like yeah, yeah i felt like a little kid waiting in line to go like talk with them i was like <laughs> all nervous like, yes yes <laughs> and in fact stacy and jesse live uh not too far from where i was living we just sold our house in ohio but stacy and jesse um live not too far from us there so um, of course, that doesn't mean that we ever got a chance to go and visit them because I'm always on the road. But you know, <laughs> that's that's the way yeah, that goes. Right. But they are—they're absolutely great folks, great folks. So that's awesome. So um, talking about Guy, uh, you know, seeing some of the work that you've done with your horses, kind of the zebra laying down and the side passing over and things like that. Was he kind of an inspiration for that? Oh, definitely. Um, I remember the first time I ever even saw multiple horses working at Liberty was um, with him. He was doing a show. I think it was at Equine Affair maybe in Ohio. It was actually during that spell where I had that broken leg. And during that time, I also went to a bunch of different horse fairs since I couldn't ride, kind of wheeled around. And I saw him and it just completely moved me. And I just, he opened a door that I didn't know was possible. And I went home and started playing around with it more. And I actually hated Liberty at first because I didn't understand it. And I, you know, just uh found it very frustrating and then I just started loving it and to get multiple horses working with you together um is has been just so neat I mean it's so neat and uh Dan James too um kind of took me under his wing um let's see it was uh in the fall not this past year but the following um I was able to watch some of his stuff with him um so I definitely both of those guys and to me like those they're uh, uh definitely the ones traveling and doing the the liberty team stuff so it's been mm-hmm. really cool to watch both of them yeah 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 well so now you mentioned studying with dan do you have any other mentors or teachers that you've worked with in the past yeah so like i worked with dan um i was there he did like a week-long liberty deal um in i think it was in indiana um and so I went to that, 
and played around there. And then um, I have gone and ridden with, um, rode with Sean Florida over there in Ohio uh, okay. to two of his clinics. And then Casey Deary, I love him. Um, he's down in Texas, a uh, reigning guy as well, very successful. Mm-hmm. And I learned so much from him this winter. I'm hoping to go back and visit with him again this fall. Um, so those are two guys that I've ridden with. Um, just some, you know, like local trainers growing up. Um, a lot of it has been trial and error and figuring out, you know, based on experience. Okay, that doesn't work. This work, you know, right. uh, which takes a, a lot of time. Um, but I just, you know, even growing up, like I would, starting in like fifth grade, I'd skip recess to go do my homework so I could spend more time with the horses. And That's it's awesome. just, yeah, like it's just been totally time consuming um for me like all the time i've spent has been with them so um yeah i mean it's been awesome to learn from a lot of different people because i am such a visual learner i think that i got a lot even from reading and just watching people that's been huge i think i sound almost a little stupid when someone tries to teach me something because i have to process it and i've got to be able to really see it in my mind i can't just listen like i'm not an audio uh how do you say it like an audio based listener Mm -hmm. an auditory learner Um, sure Sure. Yes, thank you. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I've learned a lot that way too, for sure. So that's awesome. Well, I think that's a big piece of it for all of us too, you know, is is learning how we learn and being able right. to uh to use that to our advantage. You know, that's Absolutely. that's huge, you know, for, for anything, you know, not just horses for for anything, whether it's, you know, the pharmaceutical that you were going to school for, which, by the way, right. pays a lot better than a horse trainer. I'm just going to say, oh, my gosh, but yeah, whatever, know. you know, we all make our choices. We all make our choices that we're just going to leave it at that. Um, <laughs> Right, no, but yeah, right. absolutely. You know, learning how we learn is is really so important. So that's going to bring me to the next question. So uh, you're going to travel back five years in time, and you're going to talk to little Maddie Shambaugh five years ago. So you said you're, <laughs> what, 23? So 18-year-old Maddie. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. So what advice about horses – and about business, are you going to give to little 18-year-old Maddie? Um, business, <laughs> let other people help you. Don't try to do everything on your own. Ah, perfect. Um, you need to find, part of finding success and balance with it is finding a team of people who believe in what you're doing and um, have that vision with you. And um, I can uh, very, like, say this in a very... Um, finally relieving way that I I think right now the team surrounding me is just incredibly supportive. Everyone's really excited about things. Uh, Leah Erickson just kind of took over our management position, helping with everything, and she's just awesome and making things happen, and it's great. But like I said in the beginning, I just wanted to do everything my own. I thought it was a weakness if I relied on other people. Um, So that's been huge. And picking like one thing to focus on, like what is your main objective? Don't try to do a million projects because (laughs) that's going to take the quality down and you're just going to run yourself down. So really focusing on a few, like a few things. And for me, the biggest thing with that has been developing like a five-year plan or a 10-year plan because I feel like I have to do everything right now and there's not enough time. But if I spread it out over five or 10 years, then that allows me to really, you know, make things happen and get things done versus just starting all of these projects and never finishing them. Absolutely. Um, so business-wise, that's what I go with. As far as the horses go, um, when, you know, nothing is going to be perfect, kind of going back to that theme, and it's it's hard to not take, like, any failures or any setbacks, I should say, in training as personal as saying i'm not good enough um that's what's really going to hurt you um what's going to help you is using that failure as feedback and saying okay how can i how can i prevent this in the future or how can i make this better or more effective and especially with my cult starting you know i had when i really started reshaping my cult starting program or i should say adding to it 
I had done the cold starting challenges and I found a lot of success with those and was feeling like on top of the world, like, oh yeah, I finally mastered this cold starting thing. Mm. And then I got this new Mustang Kodiak and um, kind of underestimated where he was at and things. And again, one of those instances where you're tired and exhausted and it's, you know, midnight in the barn and you're still working horses. Anyways, um, had been feeling on top of the world and he bucked me off. And that's when I hurt my back and had a lot of time to really think about what I was doing. And um, I restarted him really taking my time and experimenting with that two-way communication with the hindquarter yield and, and other concepts and stuff. And so if I had, you know, taken that experience and, um, you know, used it as something that held me back saying, you know, I'm not good enough to do this or, you know, whatever, and putting my whole personal story in it, then I wouldn't have been able to use it as feedback to actually improve. So um, I think that that's one of the big things too um, with the horses. And then of course, you know, the project thing could go along with that too, not trying to do all right. of these different things and just focus on a few. So. Right, right. It's like that old saying, you know, if you, if you chase two rabbits, you lose them both. You know. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah, cool. Okay, so bridging off of that, if you were going to give riders advice on one singular piece that they need to focus on to improve their horsemanship, what would it be? I think it would be empathy, taking the mm. time to really understand the world from another's perspective. Yeah. And when we can do that, we can effectively figure out how to build trust, how to build clear communication. But I see so many people who try to apply human psychology to horses or, um, you know, and not that some, you know, we talked about a lot, there are a lot of parallels, but there's also a lot of ways they're different than being, you know, really geared to be this right animal. And so a lot of behavior that um, should be seen as, uh, fear-based on behalf of the horse is taken as stubborn or obstinate or, um, you know, uh, disrespectful and things like that. If we were to really take the time to understand the world from their point of view before teaching them how to live in our world, I think we'd have a lot more success. So um, developing empathy, I think that is a huge, huge thing. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. Uh, okay. One discipline you'd like to try but haven't yet. Uh, okay, so, yeah, I've gotten a taste, a taste of the reining and the barrel racing. Now, with the dressage, I grew up kind of playing with it. I had, like, a local trainer that I worked with, but I don't really want to say that I really got into it. So I think that that would be my next thing is really looking at more dressage principles and riding, you know, in that discipline and learning about it in more depth. Um, would be, uh, that would be the answer for me. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. And as you know, that's a discipline near and dear to my heart. So good yeah. answer. There's bonus points <laughs> in that one for you. Oh, good. <laughs> There's definite bonus points in that. So, uh, let's see. Okay. Um, all right. I guess we should do this. Are you sponsored by any companies that we need to send a shout out to? Yes, so Crypto Arrow, um, Whole Food Horse Feed, uh, Chaffe Alfalfa, Espana Silk uh, Grooming Product. Um, I also do work with Impulse Photography and Rhinestone Lip Gloss, which are also um, very good friends of mine, too. Very um, cool. And then Untethered Design Studio um, does a lot of my graphic design. So all of those people have been super supportive and um you know, for me, the whole sponsorship thing is like, I'm not going to put something out there that I don't believe in. That's just not me. Yep. Um, if you can tell, you know, how I've been talking. So the products that I'm using are things that I really believe in. And those companies um, are led by people who are very passionate about what they do. So I'm very yes. lucky to um, call them partners. Absolutely. That's awesome. And I know Espana Silk, uh, you know, I met Trudy. Uh, Trudy is awesome. Yeah, I she love is. Trudy. She is awesome. She's very cool. <laughs> Regardless of what she's got, she's just an awesome gal. I love Trudy. She's she fantastic. Is. 
So very cool. She is. Okay, so uh, let's see. A question that was put out to me, and I would imagine the gal is probably listening, but she's too shy to ask herself. Um, Rachel, who works for me uh, on occasion and has for the last couple of years, um, basically wants to know, and I agree with her here, uh, you got a pretty damn cool fashion style. <laughs> and Rachel wants to know where do you get your inspiration for your clothing style? Wow, don't worry, I don't think she's going like, to try to steal it, but she's she's that just That is yeah, awesome. I like him honestly like a really big tomboy and like being like a girl is like really hard for me like in basic girl stuff. <laughs> so the fact that someone complimented my fashion like I'm still kind of like loving that. Like that's awesome. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But um, I love, like, that old, you know, like, buckaroo style. Yeah. Um, But it, it, like, hence my hat and my boots and stuff. Uh -huh. But at the same time, like, I love, like, um, kind of more, like, free-spirited, like, bohemian hippie type stuff. Like, I love that kind of thing. So it's kind of like a weird mix of this very traditional um like buckaroo mixed in with this like you know like hippie type free-spirited type thing um which is really cool it's kind of like with the horsemanship right it's like old concepts that kind of start to take on a new meaning or things we can improve in different ways so um anyways i uh i don't know i'm trying to think of where like i uh shop i, I love like the twisted x boots those are the boots that i have uh, yeah, um, yeah. They're totally awesome. recommend those. Yep. I have their shoe, like other shoes as well that I live in. Oh, are the shoes uh, good too? Oh yeah, that's yeah, cool. For my Western the... boots, I've been wearing Twisted X exclusively for gosh, I don't know, awesome. probably the last eight years or so, and that's awesome. I haven't tried their shoes yet, so I'm gonna have to try that now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, they sent me a few things, and Wrangler also sent me their new jean line, and um. These jeans, like, I don't think I'll ever wear different jeans again as far as her riding goes because they have, like, elastic, like, waistbands now. They're super comfortable. So a lot of the jeans you'll see me wearing are Wranglers. Nice. Um, so really, really love those. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think. Amazon is always great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, yeah, that's a little bit about clothing. Cool, cool, very cool. Uh, let's see, we do have another question that popped up here from <laughs> Kayla. Kayla, I hope you're still listening. Um, Kayla says, hey, Maddie, you're totally inspiring. I recently sent my Mustang for 30 days training, and my trainer said the reason most top trainers are men is because women mix their emotions into it. As I'm at the verge of tears and my stain oh won't my cross water. Oh, geez. Okay, here we go into this question. Uh, no, this is great. Thank you, Kayla, for sending this question. She says, what do you do to keep your cool when you get frustrated or upset? How do you work through it? Um, damn it, wow. Kayla, that's an awesome question. I'm, I'm kind of jealous that I didn't think to ask that one. So, um, All right, wow. so Kayla gets the credit for that question, and now you get the floor, Maddie. Okay, so there's two dynamics going on here. There's the gender role thing and how that has a role in emotions, which is kind of interesting, the way that that was approached by the trainer um, yeah. that we're talking about here. But then um, also just in general, when you get frustrated, that's, you know, that's been a huge thing for me. It's definitely frustrating. When you're out there working alone, you're trying to figure something out. You have no idea what you're doing or if this is working or whatever, and I get it. Like, I feel that. But it's important to realize when you feel that frustration right away, you're in unknown territory. It means that you have come to kind of this point at which your tools aren't quite serving you. Um, maybe it's because you're not incorporating the right way or you're missing a tool. So that's always a sign for me. Okay, I'm missing something here. What am I missing? And it may be hard, but you may have to just pull away from the situation, try to end on somewhat of a good note, and take time working with other trainers or, you know, studying, watching the DVDs or the clinics, you know, whatever, um, to get that missing piece of information. And if we could approach that frustration with more, okay, I'm getting to the end of my knowledge, um, how can I get more versus 
I'm frustrated. I must be terrible at this. And then I'm going to take it out on my horse because I feel bad about myself. You know, there's all these different things come into play. So um, not being afraid to go back to the drawing board. What's missing here? That's always like if you can get to the point where you feel when you start to feel frustrated, it turns instead into a head scratching like "Hmm, this is interesting. I've not seen this before. That's when you know you're making a lot of a lot of progress. Um, in the sense that you're really taking those opportunities to learn versus um, really seeing them as a setback. Nice. I love it. And absolutely, you know, frustration comes in where experience and understanding seems to leave, right? You know, it's right. And that's you get to the also, that. yeah, and that old thing, uh, I think it was Abraham Lincoln, you know, violence begins where knowledge ends i hope go. i'm quoting him right but it's definitely along those lines um i think i horses, read that like, on his facebook page yeah that was, that was yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yeah so um definitely when you come you know violence doesn't require any kind of skill you know hitting your horse with the end of your reins or the rope across that and none of that requires any kind, kind of skill it's people trying to work with things that they don't understand um and same you know with people too um so and as far as the gender component goes um i find that comment really interesting that's probably like a whole another hour-long conversation but (laughs) just some thoughts that initially come up is that for me it's not about not experiencing emotion it's just not letting those emotions be taken in the wrong way you know in, in working with your horse so to be calm and assertive and that calm energy that those horses just stick like glue to is huge but at the same time you don't want to suppress energy because then the moment it's going to come out is when you're trying to get your horse over that bridge or over that water and he can't do it and mm-hmm. all of these things surface because you don't deal with them and um horses especially the mustangs pick up on when we are incongruent and what i mean by incongruency is when you are acting like something you're not. And I'm going to give you a quick example because this is just so cool and fascinating. I love this component of it. Um, working with, you know, there's lots of healing type things that we're, we've started doing with horses um, and things like that. And I was with my sister, my little sister, the other day, and she was having a really rough day. And, you know, I told her to talk about it and help me groom some horses. So she was grooming one of my Mustangs. And he was kind of pacing and just a little bit, um, moving around a bit and as she was talking to me and she was trying to hold back tears and the second she started crying and acknowledging that those emotions were there I mean she wasn't training the horse right she's just grooming it um she started licking and chewing and relaxing and it might seem for people who don't fully understand a little hoaxy pokesy magic stuff going on here but it's really not it's mm-hmm that when you're in a state of incongruency and you're not acknowledging the emotions that you have, you're trying to be something that you're not, that requires more energy. You're going to feel more drained throughout the day if you're trying to do that for one. And the horses pick up on that. And when you have that energy, it's unstable energy. And that means you could erupt at any time. You could act in unpredictable ways. So it requires those horses um, to be a little bit on edge because they don't really know what's going to happen next. You're unpredictable. Um, that's a huge red flag when someone is incongruent with their emotions. So, um, you know, it's definitely not about um, not acknowledging them. Um, I would definitely say not letting it interfere in the sense that, you know, you don't want to, you know, obviously take emotion out on your horse. That's not what right. I'm saying, but there's right. a, there's a balance. And I think that either way, um, either way that you're out of balance can be unhealthy for your horse. Right. Absolutely. And, and I mean, that's, you know, if we, if we think about the dynamics of the herd anyway, you know, the emotional condition or the emotional state of each horse in the herd is a big part of survival. Absolutely. You know, yeah. And they've so. got to be able to pick up on that. They can't go around if someone sees a mountain lion, they can't go to every other horse and say, Hey, I think there's a mountain lion out there. You know, we should think about running here in the next few seconds here. Like they just all Absolutely. have to pick up on it. Right. And so imagine right. how sensitive they are to that. Exactly. I mean, totally. Yeah. Is that sensitivity and that, that kind of emotional synchronicity that mother nature just put into the herd that, you know, people ask all the time, well, how does that work? Well, who the hell cares? Just figure out how to use it, <laughs> right? Yeah, you know, it, it just so, is real yeah. to the horses. So we need to be able to manage that ourselves, you know, and, yeah. and utilize that. So, 
Totally. And that's one thing that just, I think, makes horses and just, you know, any equine so unique to work with. That's one of the things that really draws me to them is that quality. So it's, it's really, really interesting to see. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, for sure, Kayla, thank you so much um, for that question. That is a great, great question. Um, I'm going to say, I think in all of these questions that I've had for you, I have one left. Um, and I'm going to, I think I'm going to make this kind of a standard question across the line for all of these, uh, for all of these um, podcast or broadcast episodes. What is your definition of horsemanship? Uh, that's a good question. Um, my definition of horsemanship would be getting a, creating a partnership with our horses that is based on clear um, motivation and communication that allows us to um, in turn, refine that communication to the point, you know, I always say success, horsemanship is successful when people don't even see how you're asking your horse to do something. Um, it should be that quiet. And um, that's how horses, you know, get to the point working together in herds like we were just talking about. And that's the goal, you know, whether you're on the ground or riding. I mean, the epitome of a beautiful horse and rider pair is that pair that's in and in syn is, is synchronized together, right? I mean, it's hard to see where the horse ends and where that rider begins. So yeah. um, developing that partnership, um, which comes from the communication aspect that is just totally refined to the point of a whisper, which, you know, kind of going back to that, uh, you know, horse whispering, you know, type um that, that has kind of a magical connotation with it but that really is just a way of getting this communication that subtle um you know i think that that's a huge part of, of good horsemanship so that's that's some of my thoughts on that awesome awesome pretty cool i love that i love that um okay i lied one more question uh, two <laughs> okay. more questions so so one more <laughs> about horsemanship in general so why do you ride why do I ride? Yeah, I think we all do it for our own like, personal reasons, right? So why do you ride? It's kind of like asking, why do you breathe? Right? <laughs> it's, like, it's such a huge part of my life. Um, the fact that you can build a relationship with these animals um, and that teamwork and working together and teaching them how they can use their bodies more effectively um, is huge for me. Um and, you know, I think that that's one of the things I can actually put into words. I think that there's probably a lot that I can't right now that, you know, I kind of said just like um, a second ago, like asking why you breathe. It's so a part of me. Um, and it's, it's weird. It is kind of something like it's hard to explain because some people have it and some people don't. Right. Yes. Um, and yeah, it's so, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> awesome. 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 I love it. I love it. And, and you're right. It is uh, for the for those of us that are crazy enough to be this involved <laughs> with it. It is just like breathing. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, all right. So we're going to wrap this up here. Um, I'm going to encourage our listeners to please, if you'd like, keep submitting questions here. Maddie, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot and say, Maddie, We'll be checking in <laughs> uh, okay. with the post here. I know Kayla has just posted another question here that I'm not going to read out to you. I'm going to make sure you go back and uh, take a look at that. Uh, okay. So Kayla wants to know uh, some more about that, digging a little bit deeper. Um, so gang, if you're listening, Maddie and I are both going to be continuing the conversation through the comments section of this broadcast if you want to check in with us here on facebook uh you can again continue that conversation with maddie and i uh maddie where can everybody find you yeah so um you can look me up on facebook or instagram mustang maddie and that's m-a-d-d-e-y and then also mustangmaddie.com um and if you're ever in doubt and you forget, just search Bridalist Mustang or Cinderella Mustang, and I should come up. <laughs> awesome. Cinderella Mustang. Fantastic. And I'd love it, Maddie, if you would, uh, whenever we're done here, if 
you would go to the comment section on our thread and post uh, your contact information, your website, your Facebook group, all that sure. stuff. Um, that would be great for folks to continue uh, this conversation with you and to get the opportunity to learn from you. And uh, all right, so thank you, Maddie. I really appreciate your time. This has been awesome. We've gone quite a bit longer than I thought we would, and I've loved every minute of it. Uh, and I think it's kind of like you said a couple times, you know, a lot of these topics we could spend hours and hours talking about individually. So uh, maybe we'll get a chance to do this again in the future. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you again for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for joining. All right, gang. Uh, don't forget, join back every week, every Thursday evening at about 8 o'clock. Uh, we are going to be having, and that's 8 o'clock Eastern Time, we're going to be having our Talking About Horses audio broadcast segment. Next week, episode number three, I'm going to be joined by my friend Craig Johnson talking about reining horses and horsemanship in general. Uh, so don't forget, check back here at Patrick King Horsemanship on Facebook to catch the live feed of that. Also, check in with us on Facebook, and don't forget, we've just gotten started with the iTunes podcast. You can hear these on iTunes. If you get an opportunity, please give us a review and some feedback there. Give us a rating. We really appreciate it. Gang, thank you so much again for tuning in, and we will catch you next week.